Dental care is covered. Well, those of you who have a, uh, a health care provider as a result of your job, your job offers health benefits, when people talk about their benefits, what do people always complain about? They complain about dental care because dental care is expensive and many health care plans don't cover dental care. However, what the military is saying is that they will provide cost-free one-time dental treatment of dental conditions for recently separated vets who, and again they have to meet the following con uh, uh, qualifications, they've served for 90 days or more, they apply within 180 days of their separation from the military, in other words you just can't let this go, and again they're targeting soldiers returning from Afghanistan and Iraq. And thirdly, their DD-214, which is their passport to the benefits, and you want them to have an honorable discharge, their DD-214 does not indicate necessary dental care was provided within 90 days of discharge. In other words, they don't want people to be doubling up. Now, this does not mean that they're covering one visit. If somebody requires a, uh, a gingivectomy, as an example, well, you have to go a number of times for the dentist to complete the operation. So again, it's not just one visit, it's just they're treating one particular dental condition. So they've added dental care on to this five-year cost-free health care for veterans of enduring and Iraqi freedom. Well, there's also a benefits plan. And I need to make some comments and make some connections to some of those special issues now. You see here, the VA is allowing for the screening of depression, substance abuse, PTSD, military sexual trauma, and traumatic brain injury. They are also providing care for preventive care services, things like diabetes, high blood pressure. There is inpatient, and if treatment is necessary, there is inpatient and outpatient treatment available. There are prescription meds. They will fill the prescription of the soldier if it is so required. And there is now a women's health program, which I will detail for you. I want to make some comments now about the screening for depression, substance abuse, and PTSD in particular. When soldiers come out of Afghanistan, they go to Kuwait, and they are then surveyed and asked, are you feeling depressed? Are you feeling a little down? Are you exhibiting any signs of PTSD? Now, my problem here is that this is a self-assessment. You folks out there in drug court know how valid would you think a self-assessment of one of your participants would be if we allowed them to assess their substance abuse problem? Well, they would say, no, I don't have a problem. And, you know, that is what's happening when they come, when they come out of either Iraq or Afghanistan. They go through a gate called the gateway. They are then there. They have rooms for them, for them there, where they are then are surveyed, they ask questions. Remember last week, if an individual could not maintain the high standard of that battleground uh, uh, scenario, they said, well, 
cues that you might need help. And they said, you're depressed, you're feeling down, you're isolated, you're not speaking to anybody, you're using, uh, you're using prescription medications, and you're feeling suicidal ideation. When the soldier is given the survey, the soldier does not want to indicate that they feel any of those cues or any of those pro problems. Why? It's going to slow up them getting back home. They want to see their children. They want to see their spouse. They want to see their parents. They know that if they check off that they're feeling a little depressed, they have to go talk to the psychiatrist. And they may not make the plane back home. So there is a tendency for individuals to, in to indicate there's no problem. So they get back here to Atlanta. They get back stateside. They are not essentially assessed at that point in time. Know that, drug court professionals, and see if you can essentially steer the veteran to get assessed. Because we don't want people walking around without being assessed. Okay. Next thing, MST. I mentioned that there are, and this is military sexual trauma, 19,000 cases per year. So you may be working in a drug court where an individual comes through who may have been the survivor of military sexual trauma, we have a place for that individual to go to get counseling for that. Two places, as a matter of fact. They can either go to the VA or the vet center, and we're going to talk more about the vet center as we work through the material. Okay. We talked about preventive care, and it will be provided. There's inpatient and outpatient treatment. Very difficult to get inpatient treatment anywhere, so we're glad that they're offering that. And the prescription services that are available. Now, I mentioned earlier about the alert that's out there around the SSRIs, the uh, Paxil, the Zoloft, the Prozac for individuals who are not yet 24 years of age and there's an increased risk of suicide. Well. One way that the VA is attempting to address that situation, they're doing what they call spousal training. They want the spouse to administer the medication. That way it's more controlled. The spouse knows when the soldier, the veteran, is doubling up on meds or using meds inappropriately. So they want to train the spouse to be the dispenser of the medication, and they think that that may be a way to help reduce some of the problems that they are having. Okay, on PTSD, usually we associate PTSD with combat situations. However, I'm going to click here because I have a slide from last week that I really need to share with you. One thing about PTSD, they're doing, the VA is doing a lot of research on it, and they're discovering that it's not just PTSD that, gets, uh, that comes about as a result of a combat experience, but it also comes about uh, as a result of a non-combat experience. Okay, just remember one thing about PTSD, there is a stigma, a military stigma that has been attached to it for years. It was thought that you do not not come forward and indicate that you are suffering from PTSD, it's bad for your career. You'd be considered a little soft. Remember, there's a lot of macho in the military. Okay? I, I draw the attention to many of you who may have seen the movie Patton. And there's a reenactment of a scene that occurred after the Italian campaign when General Patton is uh, reviewing field hospitals. And he's visiting the wounded. And he talks about how they are heroes. They're saints. And then he encounters a young man who has PTSD. He's shell-shocked. He has battle fatigue. And he tells the general, please, I can't go back out there. I'm having headaches. I'm having all these signs and symptoms. And Patton beats the young man over the head. And then says, I should shoot the son of a bitch right now. Why? He's desecrating this holy place where the heroes are being patched up. So there was a thinking in the military back then that an individual suffering from PTSD, battle fatigue, you name it, is a little soft 
and is basically not military material. The military has changed its tune on that. They understand now the, uh, they're more in tune with the effects of PTSD. And very often they categorize it as moral injury is the new term that's being banted about. There are emerging themes that, they're start, that the researchers are starting to see. They're starting to see things around the theme of betrayal. An individual is out there in Afghanistan, and one of their trusted civilian counterparts betrays them, or they have to betray their civilian counterpart, and something bad happens. Again, they're starting to hear stories that relate to betrayal over and over again. It's either you get betrayed by your peers or you get betrayed by civilians who are uh, allegedly on your side. Disproportionate violence. We're starting to see many soldiers return suffering from memories associated with uh, abusing combatants that they've captured. or platoon is, enters the village one or two days after an engagement. And what do they see? They see the dead. The dead bodies are just littered all around the village. And they see the hands are cut off. The head is cut off. The feet are cut off. It's very difficult to witness that and not be affected by it. There are an emerging theme of civilian incidents where the village is destroyed by accident. These are people that you've been working with, they are your civilian allies, and then something bad happens. The memory of that is something that is troubling many of the veterans that are returning. And lastly, you see we have here within rank violence. And within rank violence uh, is usually something associated with MST, military sexual trauma. You know that that soldier was raped by another soldier, but you didn't say anything. It conflicts with your own morals, and many veterans suffer with the memory of that. Lastly, you see down at the bottom, we have a link between guilt and suicide. If you're feeling guilty about a betrayal, a civilian incident, incident disproportionate violence, or within rank violence, if you feel guilty about it, you may be at risk for suicide, and the military, the VA, is all over this one and are providing counseling for individuals who might be in that dilemma. More research is needed, and one thing that I would share with you, particularly you mental health providers and you drug treatment providers, I encourage you strongly to get on this particular website www.ptsd.va.gov. This is the National Center for PTSD. The VA is doing quite a few studies. There are a number of VA researchers there, and that's where these emerging themes are coming from. However, the situation is fluid. New interventions are being discovered weekly. And this is how you find out about them and stay a little ahead of the curve. We are definitely at the beginning. I saw yesterday that the New Jersey National Guard is getting deployed tomorrow to Afghanistan. Now, we're trying to downsize the war. We're still sending people over. That means that more people will be coming back, so we're going to have to stay sharp and understand what's going on. Okay. One of the last things on the benefits list concerned women's health. Well, it's difficult to essentially provide women with health care in a deployed area, in a, battle, in a combat zone. Why? Only recently have women redefined their roles. And as I said earlier, we now have women in combat. We have specialized units, all women who are going into the villages to talk to the Afghan women. If you want to talk to Afghan women, send women to talk to them. So women have redefined their roles, and it's very difficult, as I mentioned, to provide health care in a combat zone. What is happening, and I know from uh, firsthand experience, my wife, who's a colonel, who has to 
check off that individuals are eligible for deployment, they have to see their medical records. She had one young lady come to her with an irregular pap smear. She had to then go and tell that young lady that you're not eligible for deployment because we can't treat that in Kuwait. That's something we don't do there. Now that's because it's new. Women have recently redefined their roles. So in deployed areas, there is no women's health care. However, when they return, when they get back to Atlanta and everybody comes back to Atlanta, that's where all the services are, that is the drop point. Okay, and then you go home. Okay, when you get back, the VA has established a women veteran program, healthcare program, where they conduct full continuum of medical benefits, family planning, birth control, gender specific health care like hormone replacement, rest and GYN care, maternity and limited infertility services are made available. This is so new and the Veterans Administration is so serious about this that they have in place a women's benefits coordinator for disability benefits so that female soldiers can get the service, the care that they require. Okay, well that's what happens to individuals returning from Afghanistan and Iraq. What, what happens after your deployment and you require health care? Well, the VA has an answer for that. And their answer is that veterans who experience non-service related illness or injury post-deployment may be charged a copay, and it is small, at the VA for treatment. Example, flu, colds, auto accidents. You provide a copay, and the VA will essentially service you no problem. Okay. Well, how do you access this care, whether it's recently separated or post-deployment? Well, there's an application process. There, is, there are many application processes with the VA. It's a paper jungle. You identify the VA Medical Center for a visit to primary care. And again, this is the soldier goes, all right? Not the, case, the drug court case manager, okay? The soldier goes or the family goes to basically lock in. They complete VA form 1010 easy. And I have to laugh. The VA it has more paperwork than the criminal justice system. So again, it's no wonder that the VA has positioned at its medical centers an enrollment specialist. So you submit your 1010 easy to the VA enrollment specialist who's on site, and that gets you enrolled in the system to get the benefits that you require. Okay, you will see during the course of this presentation that I will put up phone numbers and I will also put up websites. My recommendation is encourage the soldier and the family to work through the websites because sometimes the phones are just so jammed up, you're better off getting the information that you require through the websites and therefore you need to, we need to ensure that our soldiers and their families have computer literacy, that, they're, they're, that they feel comfortable accessing the services in that particular manner. Okay, so that's how we get that care. We go, we fill out the form, and then we ride the wave. We just get in there and get the services that we're entitled to. Something that many of you are aware of, I hope, I'm sure, are the vet centers. Wherever you go to a uh, drug court conference and attend a, uh, uh, a session on the military, they talk about the vet center. And here is the contact information. This is key for you drug court practitioners. On the East Coast, there is an 800 number, and it's 800-905-4675. On the West Coast, Another 
toll-free number, 1-866-496-8838. And to divide the country up, we'll use the Mississippi River. There's also, and I, I recommend accessing through the websites, there's a website, www.vets.gov, in terms of me. Okay? At this point in time, launch the next poll in ascertaining how familiar are our drug corps professionals out there with the vet centers. And I'll give you a second to complete that particular question. People answered a number of different ways. So let me just talk about that for a second. Okay? The question reads, vet center services are conducted by A, mostly combat vets, B, private contractors, C, criminal justice professionals, and D, family members. The correct answer is A, mostly combat vets. That's going to be very important, and I'm going to stress why that's important in a second. Center. And why are these vet centers so special? Well, here is our list of vet center services. There's individual and group counseling, military and sexual trauma counseling, marital and family counseling, bereavement counseling, drug and alcohol referral. Okay, so they'll refer people out to providers. And you drug corps professionals, you're very familiar with the providers in your area. You know what they're good at and what they may not be good at. And lastly, community education and career referral. Let me make some comments about the services that are offered at the Vet Center. Okay, first up, LGBT. Now, the president repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and then behind that, he came out for gay marriage. The military is rocking as a result of having to turn the ship around, so to speak, to accommodate people. And three situations have popped up. One is that around the chaplains. Who does the military encourage a soldier to go to if they are having a problem or require counseling? One is the chaplain. Chaplains are caught in the middle their religion may not advocate for or approve of gay marriage, but they want to service the soldiers, so they're caught in the middle. The next issue that pops up is benefits. Let's suppose you have a same-sex couple, and the, the spouse that is not in the military has children, so now it's a blended family. Are those children entitled to VA benefits? Big question. And the last thing is they came out and said that uh, there will be no same-sex weddings conducted on military property. So you see the military is struggling back and forth with gay marriage and how they're going to handle it and how they can move forward with it. Another thing that an individual may need counseling about are, is financial concerns. One thing that has come up from the VA is that they are seeing a lot of suicides lately. And what they essentially attribute these high numbers of suicide is many of the soldiers are worrying about the financial situation back home. They may have been unemployed. The job that will not be waiting for them when they go back. They're having problems paying the rent. They're having problems uh, paying the mortgage. So again, there may be financial counseling necessary because, again, the military, again, is very much concerned with these high rates of suicide. Military sexual trauma counseling can be gotten at the vet center. And as I mentioned earlier, the military gets 19,000 cases per year. There is a case that they just started to try at Lackland Air Force Base in Texas where 31 women have again 
brought charges against an officer for military sexual trauma. So again, this is something that it's not a minute incident. It's not something that is casually. It happens ever so often. It seems to be something that in the past it had been underreported because individuals felt, as they do in civilian life, what does a sexual assault survivor in civilian life feel? You have to explain what happened to you to strangers. That in and of itself can be traumatic. Same thing in the military. So again, you may encounter individuals that may require that particular type of counseling. They can get it at the vet center. Uh, marital and family counseling. When I went to the Yellow Ribbon trainings for the family in Atlanta, they said that you have to go to three. And the last one is about the reunion. Because again, when your soldier c comes home, they are different. And they are going there advising the family how best to work with the returning soldier. I got familiar with this last July 4th. My wife came home for a 15-day R&R, and I can tell the difference. She's different. What is different? We communicate with our eyes. We communicate with our eyes and with three-word sentences. There is no small talk. Why? She's hypervigilant. That's what you have to be in a deployed area. Her head moves on a swivel. She's constantly looking around. You have to be alert, and you have to assert your alertness when you are deployed. So they can't turn this off once they get back home. It's going to take time for them to basically be able to re-engage with civilian life. Bereavement counseling. Some soldiers may need bereavement counseling, and something that the VA is very well aware of is survivor guilt. Many soldiers concern themselves with, why did I get back and my buddy didn't? Okay, and they, this rolls over in their head over and over again, and they may require bereavement counseling. Drug and alcohol referral. We, the, the, the vet centers refer individuals for drug and alcohol services, and the big thing is that you want to assist, perhaps, the vet centers with advising them of programs that are good at working around prescription medications. Because again, that seems to be the problem that the military is basically talking about. They have to basically get that under control because they again say that it attributes to suicides as well. Liaison with the VA and community services is something that can be gotten or acquired by attending the vet, the, the vet center. The situation is fluid. New programs are popping up constantly. The VA is very, very assertive in supporting the veteran and the family. Who knows first about these new services? People at the vet center. So you have to stay connected to the vet center just to find out what services are available. And community education and career referral. We talk about voc rehab. We talk about career referral. I got an email the other day about a new program, Vets to Cops. They want to recruit veterans who are returning from Afghanistan and Iraq to the police force. So again, career opportunities are made available and you can find out about these programs at the Vet Center. Now, what does the Vet Center offer that makes it different from any other resource? Well, essentially what happens? It's a safe place to talk. Confidentiality is the order of the day. And you folks in treatment know that confidentiality is the gold standard. If clients, if individuals who attend the vet center or your treatment program find out that, oh, the counselor shared something with another counselor that I don't come comfortable with, you've had it. People are not going to return. Vet centers offer flexible hours. They don't close up. They're not open just 9 to 5. They're open in the evenings as well. Okay? It is essentially client-based making it easy for them to individuals to access the services. It's in a community-based setting. It's not downtown, okay? 
uh, in the criminal justice building. Okay, it's a community-based service so that individuals can have easy access to the services that are offered there. They are knowledgeable of resources that are available not only in the military but also in the community. So again, very, very helpful as far as linking soldiers, returning soldiers to available resources. And here is probably the gem that many veteran treatment court uh, professionals talk about. The staff at the vet centers, they're more than 65 percent combat vets. That is very important when we start to talk about servicing Marines. Marines only want to talk to Marines, and if a Marine is not available, they want to talk to a combat vet. Okay? The vet centers can provide that. If you cannot have a Marine or a combat vet in court when the soldier is due before the judge, send them to the vet center because the vet center has people that they will open up to. All family members are welcome. Okay, so this is not just for the soldier. It's not just for the veteran. It's for the veteran and their family. And probably the sweetest of all, there's no cost ever. This, this is a free service. So again, that's what makes the vet centers so popular. Okay, next up. VBA, the Veterans Benefit Administration, what benefits and services can they provide? And here you have them listed out. Compensation. Education. I was taken aback at Yellow Ribbon Weekend of all the educational providers that set up outside, it's like a conference, where they are essentially assessing, okay, or making people available of the educational opportunities that uh, are available through the benefits uh, administration. Life insurance. Life insurance is a financial instrument that can be very helpful. Life insurance policies have a cash value. Many of our soldiers are very, very concerned about their financial situation back home and the VA says it's something that's impacting on the suicide rates. We don't want our soldiers in combat to be worried about finances back home, but when they get back home, this particular service is made available to them. Home loan guarantee, they're having difficulty maintaining their mortgage or getting a mortgage. The VBA is there to assist them in getting over the hump. Well, what? how do you get in contact with these guys? This sounds real good. Well, again, for assistance, they have a toll-free number, 1-800-827-1000. But I always recommend the websites. I think that you can get more information by accessing those websites. So again, online, www.va.gov will lead you to the Vet Benefits Administration. At this point in time, the major concern that the VA has is around suicide. And they have a national hotline. And again, the program goes under the name Help Your Buddy. Now everybody who goes into combat, you've got a battle buddy. Your battle buddy does what? Watches your back. You watch each other's back. We want that to continue once they come back after deployment. So there's a National Suicide Hotline resource, 1-800-273-TALK. If you know of an individual who's struggling, call yourself. They may not be willing to call, but call yourself so that we can get them some assistance. Okay, and just remember, why is the VA so concerned? Suicides are up in the first 155 days of 2012, 154 soldiers committed suicide. Well, we've had more soldiers commit suicide than we've had die in combat. Again, very unnerving for the Pentagon. Okay, one more service that I need to share with you 
that is specifically designed for the families or the Joint Family Support Assistance Program. And I can't figure out a way to say Jeff Sapp in a sleek, sexy kind of way. So we'll just say JFSAP. The Department of Defense required in 2007 that the Veterans Administration service families who are geographically isolated from an installation. You drug court professionals are very familiar with this where the treatment services are just not around the corner. They're geographically very far away. So I like to call this family services on wheels. You don't come to the service, the service comes to you. Now what can JFSAP provide? Financial and material assistance, mobile support services, again it's case management on wheels, it sponsors volunteers, professionals for delivery of support services. In other words, they're using local people. They're using people who know the territory. They're just not coming in to take over. They coordinate family assistance, and, it's, and this coordination is provided by Military One Source, which I will share with you how to get in touch with them in a second. There are counselors there that can assist families in whatever problem they're having. Federal agencies, state and local agencies, and nonprofit entities are all coordinated by the military one source counselors. Now, where are these places? Well, they're in every state. The teams are in all 50 states and Puerto Rico. They operate as part of the National Guard units. Now, remember, National Guards are under the governor. Find out where your National Guard units are because JFSAP is being coordinated out of that National Guard Joint Force Headquarters. And the primary focus of JFSAP is the support of families who are geographically dispersed from a military installation. Individuals may just not be near one of these centers. But again, remember, they are designed to come to you or come to the family to provide the service. Now, this military one source consultant, what does that individual do? They interact directly with the family. I've had experience with these individuals. They call me, now that they know that my wife is deployed, they call me every three weeks. And I have Miss Johnson from Atlanta call me. She asks me, am I doing okay? Do I need anything? And she just has such a calming voice, spiced up with a southern accent, and it just calms me down when I get my call from Ms. Johnson. The Military One Source Consultant links military families. Remember, your support system is not just the VA, but other families of uh, the families of individuals who are in the unit that your soldier is in as well. They conduct needs assessments to determine what is needed out there. They expand partnerships for child care. Child care is an issue across this country. We just don't have enough of it. But again, Military One Source is on top of that. They develop a web-based tool, another reason to ensure that our soldiers, our veterans in drug court are comfortable with the computer to access these websites. So there's a web-based tool for JFSAP that individuals can find out what services are available in my state that I can call on. They link partners, partnerships with uh, organizations like the 4-H Club, the Boys and Girls Club, the State Department of Education. Again, they want to build on what has already uh, existed within the state. They just don't want to come in with an overlay that doesn't meet the needs of that particular area. Okay. Well, how do you get in touch with these folks? Well, there, there it is. Visit the JFSAP homepage on militaryhomefront.com and underneath the service provider section, plug in JFSAP at jfsap.org. 
Or if you are not comfortable with that, you can call, there's a toll-free number, 888-256-9920, between 7.30 in the morning, okay, and 5.30 in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. Okay, well, I've got a little bit of time here. What can drug courts do? What you can do, develop relationships with the VA, the Vet Center, and I'm going to stretch this out, VFW, other organizations, many places have organizations for Vietnam vets. Connect to those particular organizations to get support, and you'll be surprised what you get back. See if you can arrange for veterans to be in drug court when the veteran appears before the judge. Remember, drug court is theater. What do we do in drug court? We clap for people. Imagine a vet getting kudos from other veterans. That's their family. They respect them. So again, it would help if we can get other veterans in court at the time that our soldier is, who's in drug court is in court. If at all possible, you may want to dedicate a staff member to stay on top of VA programs. You want to encourage the soldier or the family to connect. They repeated this over and over again. Don't have a case manager call. Have that soldier and their family connect because it, it's, it expedites things much better. See if you can get them community literacy, computer literacy, so they can lock onto those websites. Connect with other veteran treatment courts and drug courts to find out what they're doing, what services are available, adjust the drug screen to pick up on prescription medications, and you treatment providers, we do group to death. Be careful of group membership. When placing a veteran in a group, make sure you have other veterans there to help support them. And with that, I am going to open it up to questions. And I already see that I have one question already listed before I had questions, before I asked for questions. So this individual needs an answer. And the question is, what is military sexual trauma? And the answer I can get is sexual abuse. That would be the answer that I would give you. It's just in the military, they call it military sexual trauma. They don't call it sexual abuse. So that's that question. While I'm waiting for more questions, there is one more thing I'd like to say, and that is, uh, uh, other uh, than what else can drug courts do? You can stay current. And how do you stay current? Lock on to the uh, American University Education and Justice uh, 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 website to get more links, more articles to assist us in serving this population that has made a tremendous sacrifice. Do I have any other questions besides military sexual trauma? If I don't, then what I'd like to do is a commercial for next Thursday. Next Thursday, you're going to have my buddy Joe Madonia, coordinator for Brooklyn Treatment Court, who's very familiar with working with veterans and accessing the VA. The title of Joe's presentation, The Impact of PTSD on Veterans and Their Families in Drug Court. If you have drug court specific questions, that's the time to ask the question. Joe has a lot of experience working with these veterans, working with the VA, that can essentially save you a lot of time. And remember, that's going to be next Thursday, July 26, from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time for you folks out there on the left coast. One thing I want to leave you with, the VA is designing programs to assist the family. Being the family member, the spouse of a deployed soldier, I can tell you that the family might as well be in the military as well. So again, that's how they feel, and that's how they're meant to feel. 
and that's a good thing. So again, they're providing benefits for the family, not just the soldier. Okay. And lastly, it's been a pleasure, and I just want to thank you for participating. And don't forget, complete the survey for today's webinar, and we'll see you next week.